So we are happy to have your own uh, uh, with Dan from NYU and the Science Foundation to tell us about uh, asymptotic spectrums for surface complexity. Right. Thanks. Well, thanks for having me. Um, yeah, this talk is titled Amortized Circuit Complexity, Formal Complexity Measures, and Catalytic, Catalytic Algorithms. And this is joint work with uh, Robert Colbert, um, who is at McGill. And um, it's very fitting that, I'm, uh, that I can give a talk about, about this work here, because uh, Robert and I started this work uh, last year, while we were both um, postdocs here. Um, I've written down uh, the, the, like the sections of this talk, so I'm, I'm going to talk about uh, direct sum problems, which is a very general uh, concept in, uh, in computer science, um, and many other fields. Then I will talk about Strassen duality, which is an existing um, duality theory. And then we will move to like Boolean circuit complexity. So I will talk about Boolean formulas first, which is like the simplest kind of model that I will talk about. And I will talk about formal complexity measures. And then we'll move to amortized circuit complexity, which is kind of the main theme um, of the talk. And then I will discuss the uh, three results. First is a duality um, result for amortized circuit complexity. The second is a result about catalytic circuits. The third is a, is a result about catalytic space, which, which of course uh, shares the same uh, word catalytic, but it's uh, there's an interesting uh, difference between these two uh, concepts, which I will uh, discuss. And then in the end, if, if time permits, we'll talk about uh, some proof ideas. Um, and I guess in the middle, there will be a short, short break. All right, so let's, uh, let's start with um, discussing direct sum problems. And um, the general um, question in our direct sum problems is, um, is the fastest way to solve n instances of some computational task T um, to run the fastest algorithm for one instance achieve some kind of economy of scale by computing all these instances as a group uh, in, in one go, like in, in some more clever way. And um, so as a, as a formula, we might want to look at, so we're looking at the cost of computing uh, the task t n times. Let me just write it like this. And we're interested in the amortized cost, or the cost per copy, so we divide this by n. And then we want to know what happens if we let and go to infinity, will this number be equal to just the cost of computing a single copy of t, single instance of this problem t, or can we do better? So is it equal, or can we do, can we do strictly better? That's a general setup in these kind of problems, and it disappears everywhere in uh, like complexity theory, computer science, mathematics, um, also in physics, uh, quantum information. And um, so I'll give you a couple of examples. And I'll start with, um, so last year I've been talking about these kind of problems here, and, um, but now I'm going to give you examples of a different uh, uh, nature. I want to start with um, Shannon's source code theorem. And um, here, the task is for uh, two players and some up to do uh, the following. So they have a, they have a channel for which they can uh, send messages. And Alice wants to send 
a whole bunch of messages, so m1 up to mn, and they're all distributed. Uh, yeah, well, they have like they, they come like iid with the same uh, with this distribution d. Okay. And uh, well, she has to send them, and she she can use some uh, encoding to uh, to do this. And uh, the question is, how many? What's the most efficient way of uh, doing this type of, uh, of performing this type of task? And um, here, Shannon source coding theorem says that um, like a one-way amortized uh, cost of sending. These messages, so message M, um, is precisely the shadow capacity H of this distributed term on entropy. The shadow entropy, I'm sorry. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. yeah. It's so hard to write it over. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So H, capital H, is the shadow entropy. Yeah, you didn't say it's called amortized, but this is what you mean by amortized. Yeah, amortized means, yeah, so, so what's the, the cost? It's, it's like this, yeah. It's this kind of, uh, so the cost of sending uh, M messages, and then I, I divide that cost by, uh, by N, and uh, let N go to infinity. Um, yeah, this cost in this case is, is precisely uh, the shared entropy. So that's a beautiful, Formula. The Shen entropy is a very nice function, right? It's easy to compute. It's, uh, it's, it's has nice, very nice properties, um, and um, yeah. So this kind of solves this um, this, this amortization problem or or direct sum problem. All right. Um, let's look at another example. I'm going to switch boards. Erase this board. And um, this example is, is, has a similar flavor, but um, we allow a little bit more. So here we have, uh, this is amortized randomized communication. Um, it's, a, it's another type of problem that's, that's deeply studied. Here we again have two players. When you, when, you, when you talk about amortizing the cost NT, the cost NT is assuming that we're computing NT in the most efficient way? Yes, we, that's, the, yeah, that's, the, that's the idea. Yeah. Cost, cost means the, the, the most efficient, okay. the, the cost of the most efficient algorithm. Yeah, yeah. so the complex, I mean complexity. Yeah. Um, so in this problem, Alice and Bob, they well, they receive some, they, they receive random bits. Well, let's, let's start first by what they want to do. So they, they, give a, they are given a function. Um, and uh, two, two bits, um, which together they need to, to compute. And um, what they get as a resource is some random bits. And uh, of course they receive an input. X from capital X, and Bob gets Y from capital Y. And then they start communicating, so this is a two-way kind of situation, so they start communicating. And then at the end of this, this whole protocol, they need to produce, each of them need to, needs to produce um, the, the function value. Yeah. And the question is how many, how many rounds of communication, uh, uh, how many bits do you need to, commu uh, to, to, to uh, communicate? Um, well, this is not, so this is not really amortized, right? So what, what is the amortized situation? It's where instead of single um, input, both players get a whole list of inputs. And they need to compute all the values. And um, here we also have a beautiful Characterization, 
by um, Braverman and Rao, which says that I won't fully explain this, but which says that the amortized uh, randomized communication equals information complexity. Okay, so whatever that is, it, it's a it's a it's a beautiful formula, a beautiful alternative characterization of this amortized kind of um, um, complexity measure. Right? So, so let me just say one more word about yeah. what it is. Yeah. Because it is in, uh, this is intuitively related to Shannon. So for the theorem, this information complexity, instead of counting the number of bits that change in the protocol, it counts sort of the entropy. Uh, that uh, is transferred in the protocol, or how much in information theoretic terms each of the players learn about the other person's input from the protocol. So it's also an entropy type uh, measure. It existed for 15 years before this theorem was derived. It's uh, an yeah, amazing conclusion of a long line of research. Good chat, thanks. Would you exist this about 10 years ago or 8 years ago? Yeah. So, um, the final example that I want to talk about, and I will be working a little bit more with this example, is um, so, so, in this case, it was very clear that we were doing amortized, that we were working with an amortized uh, kind of situation. But sometimes um, you will be working with the dark sum problem without knowing it. And, um, and an example of this is, is the major fundamentation problem. Um, right, the major fundamentation problem asks, what is the smallest number omega um, such that Two n by n matrices can be multiplied uh, using ego of n to the power omega uh, operations. The operations means arithmetic operations, so uh, plus n times. Smallest really means infimum, but doesn't really matter. And um, it's known that this omega is between 2 and 2.37. And we've, we've recently seen a, even an improvement uh, on this 2.37 by Almond and Williams. Um, but this problem doesn't really have like an amortized flavor, right? If you look at it, I mean, we're multiplying matrices. They're very large matrices. OK, fine. But it doesn't really look like this kind of this kind of property, like this kind of quantity. However, um, there is a way of, of thinking about it like an amortized problem, namely, or direct sum problem, namely this, this two to the power omega is exactly what's called the asymptotic rank of a certain tensor. There's lots of words that I haven't introduced yet, um, and that I want to talk about a little bit now. Um, but this kind of this this asymptotic rank will be of this form. So let's talk about this. I don't know if you're going to say this, but there is a simple way to see that it's a direct sum problem. When you multiply two vertices, two matrices by each other, you think of the first matrix as fixed. And the other, like a bunch of like n column vectors, so you are really multiplying a fixed vector, uh, matrix by, and you are, you are solving n times a matrix vector multiplication problem. And this upper bound that is two point three seven, or it doesn't matter what it is, anything below n cube means that you are doing it much faster than you would do one matrix vector multiplication that takes n squared. It's funny because I think the, the way I think about it, or will write it now, I think it's different because it's more like 
um, you use the property of uh, um, like if you multiply two block matrices, you, you can multiply them blockwise. Is this, is this kind of recursion? I know, just, uh, I yeah. know but uh, if you think about the problem I stated, yeah. it's, uh, yeah. I think it's a sort of shocking yeah. uh, uh, consequence of this uh, fast matrix multiplication, even though it has fast and one, yeah. that you can do it at times much faster than you would do it once. Yeah, you, you think of it's like like a streaming problem. Well, I mean, if you, you don't yeah, give it, yeah, exactly. the yeah, if you would give them one by one, it, it wouldn't. You know, no, no, but you don't give it. Also, yeah. there you don't give it one by one. The yeah. whole point of that is some problems is you get all the yeah. instances at once. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. 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 Um, so let me let me go into this a little bit more. Okay, this this kind of uh, situation because I want to talk about the Strassen duality um, briefly in that language. By the way, if you don't get any of this, I mean, I, I will, I'm going to restart later, but with um, uh, with, with like Boolean, Boolean uh, functions, Boolean circuits, so there you can then uh, um, get back. Um, all right, so let me talk a little bit about this. So I want to, so this is a little um, tensor ring. Crash uh, course. To which you've now been enrolled. So, um, yeah, the way I want to explain this is uh, the way I usually explain this is that for if we have two matrices A and B, then I want to write A is at most B if there exists two other matrices, U and V, such that A um, equals U times B times V. Yeah, so A is at most B if I can obtain A from B by doing applying linear operations on the left, applying a linear, linear uh, applying a matrix to the left, and, and uh, applying a matrix to the right. And they don't have to be inverted at all. Um, for K tensors, so this is for matrices. For K tensors, ah, ah, wait, I'm skipping something, sorry. I need to explain to you what the K tensor is first. Yeah. Going to back up a little bit. Because it's a tensor for press course. I need to start with tensors. So a K tensor is simply a K dimensional array of numbers, um, of numbers from some field. And we say that the K tensor is simple if it is the tensor product of K vectors, or like an outer product of K vectors. Now, the tensor rank. So, for is just a rank one matrix. That's right, yes. The tensor rank of a K tensor is simply the, to define by R, if A, which is my K tensor, is the smallest number R, such that A is the sum of R uh, simple tensors. Simples, I wrote. Okay. Simple. No. So simple generalized, so it's like a rank one. So the rank one tensor, it's, well, a, it's, it's a tensor product of k vectors, or outer product, some people would say, k vectors. That's the tensor rank. Tensor rank, hard to compute, um, very important property, important uh, parameter. Now, the asymptotic tensor rank. Is defined as follows. We take so it's, it's, it's written like uh, as, as R tilde of A. It's defined by taking my tensor A to a large Kronecker power. So this is like for matrices, you have a Kronecker with a Kronecker product, right? Here I have a, uh, I also have a Kronecker matrix, a Kronecker product on tensors, and I take this uh, this uh, this Kronecker power of my, my tensor. Don't tell me about that. Okay. 
And the value of the And I compute the rank, and I take the nth root and let and my handwriting is really and it's n goes infinity. I think the smaller the font, the harder. Yeah, right. I, I realized that. Yeah, I tried to improve. <laughs> but but it's not. It, it's more about uh, the back. This old background. So um, how people get uh, the rough story. So this is the asymptotic tensor rank, which is like an amortized kind of uh, uh, parameter, right? The logarithm looks very much like. Uh, right. If, if I would take the logarithm, it would also become. You would you would have this uh, am, this additive amortization. Yeah. The one over m is outside the r, so that's r of the yeah. tensor product of m copies, yeah. and then one over m. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So it's like, what's the rank per copy? Right. And this is different. Is this different than the border rank? This is different than the border rank. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so we have rank, and rank upper bounds border rank, and then border rank upper bounds asymptotic rank. Turns out, mm. it's not clear, right? But it's true. Um, this is the smallest of all of them. And um, and they can all be different. For matrices, they're all equal because matrix rank is uh, multiplicative under under t uh, chronic product or tensor product. But for tensors, it's can, this can be strictly smaller, so you can have uh, you can you can uh, do better. Um, and what I wanted to say here is that. This is the theorem. This is already quite old. This is by Garten Berg, '85, and um, he observed that um, there is a there is a three tensor A such that the asymptotic rank of A. He was kind of the first to formalize this equals two to the power. Of so there exists an A you want to write. Yeah, so this is, yeah, there exists an A, so this is, right, this is uh, so-called matrix multiplication tensor. It's a small tensor, one fixed small tensor, and you want to compute the asymptotic rank of it. And if, omega is the, the same omega as before? Yeah, omega is this exponent of matrix multiplication, and it characterizes the complexity of multiplying large matrices. Yeah, and we don't know. And we don't know what it is. Yeah. Um, good. So now I can talk about these pre-orders that I was already talking about here. So for matrices, I could say A is at most B if um, A equals U times B times V for, for some other matrices U and V. Okay. Now this extends directly to tensors. Yeah, maybe you should say because matrix says it's the same as A has the length at most the length of B. That's right. Um, so I want to talk about Stassen duality. That's what this section is about. Um, indeed, this pre-order is equivalent to saying the rank of A is at most the rank of B. Um, it requires a little bit of thinking to see this. I mean, you need Gaussian elimination really to, to see this. Um, the important thing is that this kind of definition extends directly to, to k tensors. So if I have two k tensors, a and b, I can, um, I can define a most b analogously. And um, what that means is that instead of two matrices, there will be k matrices, and I will I will apply them to each of the, the k dimensions of B in order to get A. And then I say A is most B. Now, I need this pre order to define um, the so called asymptotic spectrum of tensors, which is a. Yeah, 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 yeah. make sure that everybody understands what uh, this analog is. You are just, you have k dimensions instead of two, so you apply a linear transformation in each dimension, and you get back the other term. Like you need two because it makes it much, uh, because you have two dimensions and k dimensions into the thing. So you allow change of basis in each of the spaces that the tensor is uh, different. It doesn't have to be square or anything like that. 
I hope that's clear, although it's a background, so um, it's good that people understand. So now, the following definition is by Strassen from uh, 86. Um, we define a uh, set X to be the collection of all the maps, mu, from tensors to non-negative reals, for which uh, three, three properties hold. So I want mu to be multiplicative. Uh, mu must be multiplicative under the tensor product. It must be additive under direct sum on tensors, which is just like for matrices, but for tensors. It must be monotone under this preorder that I just defined. So if A is at most B, then mu of A must be at most mu of B. And mu of a diagonal tensor of size N Be n. So if I take any diagonal tensor with ones in the main diagonal, then I want mu to have value n. Right. Just like matrix rank has value n on an on an n by n identity matrix. This is first. So the set of tensors of any for any k. We fix k. Yeah, yeah. Let's fix k. Yeah. But we don't fix the dimensions. You fix the dot. Yeah. The size of the dimension. You don't fix yeah. the. Yeah, length yeah. Of the... So I fix the order, but not um, um, not the size of the tensor. I think of it as a k-dimensional array, and but I don't fix how large your array is. Just the number of uh, indices in the array. Sorry. So direct sum is concatenation. Direct sum means uh, you you take these two tensors and you put them as blocks. Yeah. The main yeah. Argument. yeah. Okay. That's right. So, what's the point of this uh, this set X? The mu of the diagonal tensor, yeah. the, the, the diagonal tensor with all ones? Or, yeah. Or, or yeah, put all ones. Yeah, maybe about scalars or something like that, where the new care about scalars? This, um, so this pre-order allows you to scale. So it will, under the pre-order, like mu is monotone under the pre-order, and the pre-order will allow you to do the scaling. So mu will be invariant under scaling okay. of the tensor. Even if, if your tensor is diagonal, then you could even scale the diagonal elements independently. Yeah, yeah. And mu yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks. Great. Um, so what did Strasse prove about this? He proved that um, the asymptotic rank of any tensor T equals the maximum over all mu in x of mu of t. So, in particular, if you want to understand the matrix multiplication exponent, it's, um, it's enough to understand x. Right? If you understand what the set x is, and you understand it really well, <laughs> then, um, then you can perform this maximization for this uh, matrix multiplication tensor A, and you will obtain um, 2 to the omega. But is this but preliminary to this, you should look at this and see a duality theorem, because the asymptotic rank is defined as the infinite, right? And uh, the, yeah. the right-hand side is the maximum. So there is a duality theorem there for a complex, uh, you know, or the ring structure. Model. That's a good point. So to think of this as like a duality, like a min-max situation, if we go back to, um, to the definition of asymptotic rank, I define it as a limit, but because rank is somewhat multiplicative, you can also write this as, a, as an infimum. So it's like a, so asymptotic rank is a minimization problem. And here, of course, I wrote it as a maximization problem, so because in this sense, to think of it as a duality, a min-max relation, min-max principle. So, so tense, usual tensor rank is not it's this. one of these? Oh, no, uh, yeah, okay, sorry. Usual tensor rank is not one of these mu's because it's not multiplicative. 
uh, and also not not additive. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. But it's nor but it's normalized, but um, and it's monotone. So it's in the k equal to case. Good. So what do you think x is in the k equal to? K? Is it only the length of yeah. the matrix? Yeah. It's the. Um, yeah, you should watch some earlier talks with me to explain this in more detail. Here, I just wanted to point out this duality theorem. And um, um, so what I want to say about this is that this, now I applied it to tensors. This is how Strassen also talks about it. He, um, he wants to, like his motivation was to understand tensors and to understand matrix multiplication. But this theory is much more general. So you can apply this to all kinds of other objects, for example, you can apply this to, to graphs and understand uh, the shedding capacity of graphs, or you can apply this to, uh, to sunflower, the sunflower problem or the capsule problem, or um, lots of problems in quantum information theory can be characterized uh, in this way, and has been characterized in this way. Um, and, but we're not going to talk about that. I want to talk about uh, Boolean formulas, and we're going to see some Similarity there, and then um, we're going to discuss that more. So, this is this. Now we're moving, now we're going back to the Boolean world. I want to talk about Boolean formulas. Um, well, Boolean formulas um, is a very simple model of, uh, of computation. Um, namely, you start with. Um, can, can I stop it? Just yeah. for one minute. It's not completely clear. Is there some structure, like some obvious structure of X, uh, that you can say? I, I guess I cannot see here like a group structure or something like that. Is there something? Yeah, no, I, I don't, also don't know about some kind of group structure. There, there are lots of structures on it, and um, we're also trying to understand better what what, the, what they are. There's a there's a, there's a topological structure on it. There seems to be in many cases some kind of complexity type of structures on it. Well, so, so the, topo the topology is the weak topology, like on on. Yeah. So you look at the topology generated by the values on tensors. Yeah. That's, so you would you would you would define an evaluator like for every tensor you have an evaluator function and this you would you would use the, like the coarsest topology that makes all of these functions uh, continuous. continuous. So that's the weak topology. Yeah, and then it becomes a compact space, compact Hausdorff space. Um, that's one fact. Um, um, and there are lots of other facts. For matrix multiplication, we know a little bit more. We know that it's uh, like a connected. Um, Set, for example, which which so is a non-trivial theorem yeah, yeah, yeah. that it's yeah. connected. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, yeah there are lots of. Uh, but for example, we don't know whether for arbitrary tensors it, it's a connected or convex set. So lots of things we don't know. Um, that's good. Any more questions about the uh, other great world? Boolean formulas. So here um, we want to compute Boolean functions. Um, so this is a model of computation, and um, it works as follows. You start with a bunch of uh, literals. So literals are um, variables for their negation. So for example, I have x1, x2, x3, um, not x1, and maybe maybe this is enough. So um, then what we do is we apply either an end gate, so this is the, the Boolean end function, or we could apply an or, an or gate, Boolean or function, and in a tree-like fashion we repeat this until we are left with a single node, and this single node then recursively computes a Boolean function f on the on the input variables, right? And um, yeah, so it's a very simple model of computation, um, but proving lower bounds. So so what we want to know is, given a Boolean function f, what's the smallest circuit that computes it? Right? It's the, the the smallest formula that computes it. We can call that the formula size. And here I want to measure the formula size as the number of leaves. Number of leaves. So in this case, it would be four. Um, 
Improving lower bounds for the, for the formula size of, of, of an explicit Boolean function is a, is a long-standing open problem. And um, one way of doing it, so how could you prove a lower bound on the formula size? That's using the notion of a formal complexity measure. Uh, mu, which is a function from only a functions to the reals, such that um, mu is monotone. With respect to n and or. So, what do I mean by that? I mean that if I take mu of f n g or f or g, so this could be either n or or, then this is at most mu of f plus mu of g. So that's just what I mean by monotonicity. Yeah, although it's, it seems to use the same letter mu up to there, it's more like the uh, times and class. Uh, yeah, no. But, uh, no, you don't want to do that. This is really monotonicity in this. Um, yeah, in it's the analogy. Not the same. It yeah. looks like, yeah, okay. Well, it does. And the way it's not is that what we'll do is um, <laughs> um, going ahead a little bit. Um, we won't have a multiplication. We will only have an addition in this situation, and the addition will just be um, that you... Right, I'll wait for it. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> uh, Yeah, so don't think of these operations as addition of n multiplication. Um, so mu is monotone, and mu is uh, normalized. And an or. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a phrasing, yeah. So for now, there's no pre order or anything yet. I'm just, uh, I'm just defining it like this. It's my definition of monotone. So I'm saying. So it, it, you, don't, you don't distinguish between n and or. Both that's right. Both, both, of, them, both yeah. of them are, are sub yeah. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. Because also in a the formula, they don't have any special. Yeah, no, no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Sometimes like, one looks like take you down and one takes you up. So yeah, okay. I mean, here yeah. yeah. um, mu is normalized in literals, by which I mean that mu of any literal, which is a variable or the negation of a variable in it, okay. is at most one. What's literal? Literal is any of these guys. So it's like it's x i or, or x i bar. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So mu of xi will be at most one. Mu of xi bar will be at most one. Okay, it's my normalization. Now, how do you use these guys? This is kind of a proper theorem. Namely, um, for any Boolean function f, Any F Boolean function, the formula size C of F equals the maximum over all these mu's over here of mu of F. And this is a simple theorem. There's, this is really not complicated. Um, namely, you first observe that for any mu, what C of f? The C of f, I mean the formula size of, of a Boolean function. So it's the smallest uh, size of a formula that computes the Boolean function f. The so smallest number of leaves in a tree like that, other okay. than just as f. Yeah. And um, yeah. Now, so the proof has, well, it's really two observations, of course. The first is that any mu, any mu lower bounds 
the formula signs, which you can prove by induction over the formula. Right? If you take uh, mu of f, then by monotonicity we know that mu of f is at most mu of the function that's computed over here plus mu of the function that's computed over here. And then you recurse until you reach literals, and there you know that the value of mu is at most 1. Right? So this gives you um, a lower bound on the, on the, on the formula signs. And to see that you actually have like a strong duality, um, that is simply because C of F, like C is itself uh, a mu. C is itself a form of complexity measure. So it's a little bit silly, and um, but later on we'll see more interesting examples. But um, yeah, to prove this, it's also not, not very hard, uh, but this proves that this is the proof of the theorem roughly. Okay. Now, um, of course, if we now compare Strassen's theorem uh, to this kind of folkloric theorem about Boolean formulas, we see this is exactly the same, the same uh, 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 format, right? Yeah. And can, can you also make C as like the interim or minimum or something? The, the minimum number of lists of It is a minimum. In yeah, yeah. Only from the last for every function, and you want the minimum, but that's how it's defined. It's yeah. defined as a way. In all cases, this course is the best algorithm you have for the family you care about. And yeah. the measure of that you are counting communication and number of lists, whatever. Yeah. Yeah. So, is it, okay. so, there's two, two but so far, it's not amortized. This guy is not amortized. Yeah. Which is because all your formulas. Don't really amortize because they only compute a single, single function. Um, but um, yeah, so we have these two dualities uh, now. We have Strassen's duality uh, on tensors, and we have this duality on um, yeah, Boolean functions, and um, they look very similar. So is there what, what what's going on? Is there some kind of is there some kind of underlying um, uh, theorem here that's maybe much more general than? That is kind of simple, simple duality. And the answer is yes. This is what I'm going to talk about now. And um, this has to do with amortized circuit complexity. When you take two functions and you make one of the operations, but you take a function and make the operation with itself, and you look at C, it's just additive. It's just a uh, you, you mean you, you take one function and you compose it with itself? Like, uh, is that what you're saying? Or what are you yeah, like? Although, no, no, it's stupid, but that's your, you're just kidding me. No, never mind, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Well, you could make, you could, well, uh, yes. there are ways of, of doing that properly. Yeah. Um, okay. So I'm going to talk about amortized circuit complexity. And then I'm going to tell you about a new duality result for, for amortized circuit complexity. And um, the situation here is very general. But I will, I will like, give you examples to make it concrete. So amortized circuit complexity. We, we pick a set G. Um, a finite set of, of gates. So this is a finite gate set. And we really we are in a very general situation. So for example, this finite gate set could be um, these n and or gates, right, for formulas. Um, but I'll allow you to, to do much more. So I'll allow you um, for these gate sets to have multiple multiple inputs, uh, multiple outputs. Right here, we didn't have multiple outputs. Every gate only produces a single has only a single output. But we're going to do it more generally here. And I allow you to assign a cost to every gate, uh, which can be different per gate. So we can assign different costs. Gate. Let me give you an example of this. 
this example is a, so the first example is this formula, right? This, this, this formula um, um, model, where the gates are n and r. And um, we also, I also think of these literals as gates, so it's just a single gate that produces a literal at cost one. Okay, so the literals are produced at cost, at cost one. And then we have these and and or gates, which you all put together. So that's, in that case, that's the set G. That's my final gate set. How do we define a gate? A gate is just any, any function that takes a, a bunch of uh, a Boolean functions and it produces another bunch of Boolean functions. Um, it's very general, but I, I will stick to examples, so I hope that makes it more clear. And um, the first example is the branching program. Um, in a branching program, we have a couple of uh, start nodes, maybe just two, say two start nodes or more, and from every, every node we have outgoing edges, and they will be labeled by a literal and its negation. So for example, here I have x1, this is very small, but this is x1, and then on the other arrow, I have x1 bar. And this corresponds to, uh, to a branching, so we're querying the variable x1. And if x1 equals 1, then we go, we follow the first uh, arc, and if x1 is 0, we follow the other uh, arrow. Yeah, so I can, I can make a whole like, program using these kind of branchings, right? So maybe here, um, to x2, x2 bar, and uh, maybe I'll do another one here, x3, x3 bar, let's say x, it doesn't really matter, x1 and x1 bar. Good, so you, don't, you get this, uh, this network of, uh, of arrows, and um, uh, in the end, here we have these output nodes over here, which we label by, say, f1 and f2. Now, how does this model compute a Boolean function or a set of Boolean functions? You um, you pick a setting for the variables, right, for the for all the xi's, and then you start at the start node, and you follow the the arcs that are active by your because of your input. So, for example, if x equals, um, say, 1, 0, 1, then you would follow, would follow this, this one is active, x1 is active, x3 is active, so f1 of uh, 1, 0, 1 will be 1. Okay, so, um, yeah, so you look at all the paths that are that, that become active under your assignment, and this uh, in this way you compute um, a Boolean functions on the output nodes. Wait, do you say that f one of this point is one, or do you? You see it from the program. That's what the program does. Oh, so this, this tells you how this this uh, this enables me to read what f one would be. That's right. Okay. Yeah. So whenever so f one equals one, if and only if there is some path. That leads to it? That leads to it, from some, from some start node. I, don't, I also don't care which start node it comes from. And same for F2. Do, do I count how many paths, or, I get, or they get only the value 1 or 0? We don't count. Yeah, it's just an or. OK. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so what we're doing is branching, and when, when arcs come together, when arrows come together, we, we take the or, the Boolean or. So you just see if there, is, if there exists a path. Um, so this is a well-studied uh, model of, comput of uh, computation. And um, to think of it in this, in this gate set way, um, I want to have G to have an OR gate 
which corresponds to uh, arcs coming together. And I want my set to have a, like a query gate, which given a Boolean function, it computes f and xi, and f and xi bar. But this precisely corresponds to, to branching out on a certain node. So you have, you have computed f at a certain node, and then you do a branching, which corresponds to computing uh, f and x3, x3, for example, and f and x3 bar. That's what the query gate, the query gate does. So that's just a different way of thinking about this, this branching program. Um, maybe not the, the way you normally think of it, but um, um, it's a way of doing it. And um, yeah, so that's an example of uh, this kind of fine gate set besides the formulas. Now, if we have um, any such fine gate set, we can define um, like the complexity relative to this fine gate set G of any Boolean function f. One or many? Let's do many. Yeah. So let's say we have a set or a, a multi set f. It's a multi set, so okay. it has a bunch of Boolean functions. F1. Sorry? It's a multi set, but it, you can you want to figure oh, it's a multi set. Okay. Yeah, it's a multi set. Yeah, yeah, that's maybe okay. the, I think it's yeah. a list. It's a collection of Boolean functions. Okay. Um, and I'll define this complexity as the minimum cast of any of any G circuit. So it's, it's, a, it's a circuit composed of my gates computing all the functions in my multi set. Yeah? Any Boolean function can be like like this. Yeah, this, this is a, this is a complete model. This okay. this model can compute any function, um, absolutely. Um, and um, same as formulas, right? Maybe that's more clear for formulas. Yeah. Uh, and but the interesting interesting difference, of course, here is that between these two models, like formulas and branching programs, is that formulas really compute only one function. Branching computes a bunch of functions. Branching naturally computes a bunch of functions because the branching rule always computes like two functions. But for any any bunch of functions that I give, there I can find at least one. Yeah. At least one. Minimum. Yeah. In the worst case, I will. I mean, I, I can do it in a naive way. I just uh, have a branching program computing one function, and then I have a branching program computing another function. And I'll just put them yeah, below each other. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Because I will allow you to forget things like. In a, allow you to forget F2, for example. Okay. Um, so, and the cost here would be what? The number of errors? Would be the number of errors. So what I will do is I will say um, the OR gate is free, and the, the query gate has cost 2. Well, that's another way of saying the, you count the number of errors. That's another way of saying you count the number of errors. Yeah. Yeah. Can you say again? So, so this is for general G or for this? This, uh, this is for general G. Yeah. This definition. So I'm, I'm being a bit imprecise about this means, like finding data set, right? Uh, yeah. Okay. But um, I wanted to avoid a little bit. So, so for example, branching program or formula. Um, Sorry, Zeron. Can I ask a question? I'm still yeah. a little confused about the mapping. Of uh, the the uh, branching program to the to the gates, uh, so oh, okay. maybe yeah. I'm being dense, but it seems to me like a like yes. I wanted, yeah. So if you want to me to associate a function with every, yeah, just can you talk through how you're associating a function with every edge, or every so node? so so I mean, a, 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 a functional, uh, like you said, it uh, takes functions as input and outputs functions. Yeah, that's what the gate does. Yeah, that's right. So um, yeah, I just don't see it. I, I see, don't see. Yeah, yeah, good. So, so here in this uh, in this picture over here, 
I think of starting with like a constant, a constant one function over here, and then I apply the query gate, which will compute let's use a different color, um, which will compute for me um, x1 over here, and it will compute for me x1 bar down here. But I also, um, of course, from down here, I have an arrow uh, going up, so I will get here x1 or x2 bar, right from this arrow. And down here I get x1 bar or um, x2. So this is the situation at the, at the, first, at the first layer. And, um, and then you continue. So in, on, this, on, the third, on the second layer, uh, what I'll get for f1 is um, uh, it will get, for example, I think I understand. Is it because your branching programs only allow, only allow in two things to come in? Or is the or like a? Um, it doesn't really matter. Let's say it's a fan in two. Yeah. But you yeah. gave it cost two. Oh, so you I, gave the query. <laughs> only the query. So the or gate, I don't give any costs. The or gate is free. But the query gate, I give cost two. Which, course, which is because, I do that because the query gate gives me two arrows. And I just want to count the number of arrows. Okay. So that makes sense. Um, so in this picture, how many total gates are there? Six? Yeah, so you would have like one, two, three, four query gates. And then there will be a bunch, and there's a bunch of or gates, like one, two, three, four OR gates. Um, I don't count for the cost, I don't count the OR gates, I only count the query gates, and I count them at cost two. Right, so in the end, this circuit has cost eight. So there are four, uh, four branching gates. Here there's one branching on, here I'm branch, branching on X1, here on X3, here on X2, here on X1. I think, I'm get, I, think I know what, I, what was missing maybe before for me, if okay. this helps anybody else. So I guess uh, the gates can take any number of functions as input, but also output any number of functions. And so Robert sent me a, sent me a chat on the side. So the query gate, like it, it creates, to, you know, however many edges come out of it, it creates that many nodes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's right. Okay. That's right. Thanks. Um, okay. So. Yeah, so now I have to find this, uh, this general notion of uh, cost of a, of a G circuit, like a cost of, uh, of computing a bunch of functions, not just a single function. So now we can talk about the first result. CG and is CG of that F or C of uh, and C of F are the same? Uh, like you have the the one that comes, you have that one for formulas. So yeah. th th this was when I talked about formulas, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, if we pick a different sets G, we'll get different, then C of G will become different. Like for different choices of my data set, C of G will become. Uh, we'll, be, uh, we'll get a different value on, on a Boolean function. But if it's and and or, like in your original... For formulas, it was and and or. Does it match this C of F on your right board? Yes. Whiteboard? Yeah, that's right. I don't answer question. Sorry. Yeah, good. So for formulas, if, if the gates are and and or, then this, uh, this, this is what I talked about earlier for formulas. It corresponds to C of G. C sub G of F. 
Okay, so we have C sub G. Now we can, of course, define the amortized cost C twiddle sub G of F. This is the amortized um, G circuit complexity of, uh, of F, which formally is defined as the limit of I'm going to infinity of um, C sub G um, of the multiset with M copies of F. So you can call it MF like the empty before. That's right. This we define. This we, this we divide by M, of course. So that's the amortized G circuit complexity. MF means that the, the, the multiset is M copies of F? That's right. Thanks. This is the multiset of uh, M copies of F. And um, following what we've seen uh, for formulas, we define um, a G complexity measure. to be any function mu from Boolean functions to the reals such that mu is um, monotone in the sense that if, if there is a, a gate, a G gate, which maps my function, some functions f1. Maybe g. Sorry? Maybe function g is open. Well, there will also be g's yeah. because it will map oh. f's to g's. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, okay. yeah. Yeah, yeah, okay. Um, and some bunch of uh, Boolean functions, it maps it to some other bunch of Boolean functions, that's my gate. So if there is a gate that does this for any Boolean for any collection of Boolean functions, um, and this gate has cost C, yes, remember all my gates have a cost, then I want mu of F1 all sums up to a mu of Fn to be at most mu of g1 plus up to mu of gm plus my cost. Okay. That's what I mean by monotony. And um, the formula of cost for zero. For formula, the cost of n and or is zero. That's right. Um, and, uh, and for formulas, we also had that and we also have this normalization, right, which I've also put here. Mu is normalized in the sense that mu on any literal variable or its negation is at most one. Okay, so that's a G complexity measure. It extends the, like, the formal complexity measures that we've seen for formulas. Right? Remember, formal, formal complexity measures lower bound formula size. Um, here, what we prove, this is our first result. It wasn't the, the literals parts of the part of the gates? Yeah, so the, then this gates cost one, so well, the measure is the most one. So why is the, 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 the normalization specifically to literals and not to gates? Because the formula size uh, counts uh, or uh, variables. Oh, you said you asked why. Yeah, so you, oh, oh. They are special. They are linked. They're special. Um, often that's that's the natural thing to do, to say literals have cost at most one. So I think the definition of, uh, of like a general G with a set of gates, we didn't require that the cost of gate literals was at most one. That's right. But we, we will now. Yeah. Yeah. 
Although in the general theory, you don't, you don't really have to. You can do it differently. I need some kind of boundedness condition. So the easiest way, I need to get some kind of starting point. Like something has to, I need to produce literals at least to be able to apply gates to it. I need something to apply gates to. And the simplest way of doing this is just saying, okay, uh, the literals you get at cost one. And then you can start building your circuit. Um, but yeah, that's, that's the explanation. Um, now, yeah, our first result is a duality theorem for this amortized complexity of any Boolean function f, namely this equals uh, the maximization over all these uh, g complexity measures mu of mu of f. So G is any finite gate set, F is any Boolean function, mu goes over the G complexity measures. And also here, uh, a G circuit is a complex together. A G circuit, like in the formula size, a formula, formula size was a particular mu. So also here, I guess, it's a, a G circuit what gives you a... You mean C of G? Yeah, see, see, so, I mean, so this this maximization is a good question. I, I don't think, so C, twiddle of G will not be one of the numbers. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Right. Okay. But, for example, in the branching program example, you don't seem to have literal as, as one of your gates. Yeah, good point. Okay, yeah, this is annoying because I was, this is, yeah. There, it's more natural maybe to say you get the constant functions uh, at cost one. But it doesn't really matter. You could also say... Because like, as, yeah. as, as you're written it, it's like yeah. infinity, right? Uh, um, yeah, 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 yeah. So, well, what you could do is start with a, with a, with a literal and then start branching. So you have, you start, instead of, instead of starting at one, you will start with a literal and then you apply a branching to it. So you could start, uh, maybe my node already computes a function, x1. Yeah, I'm just trying to understand. Yeah, you have a good point. Yeah, you have a good point. Um, so one way of, of doing this with starting with literals is that you then say, okay, I always start with a literal at my starting node. Then I start branching, so here I would compute uh, x1 and x2. Here I would compute x1 and x2. I'm just, I'm just trying to... Very tired, didn't sleep at all. Yeah, I'm just trying to figure out if this is maybe, I mean, it just seems like this equality is not correct if you change the normalization to something like every gate with zero inputs uh, has to be normalized or something. We could also do that. Maybe that's also a nice way of doing it. For branching programs, maybe the nice way of doing it is that you say, um, like, like mu of a constant function is a constant. Because then you just start with your 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 nodes, your starting nodes at at like that would be assigned to function one, like the constant function one, and then you start branching. Yeah. But it, it won't it won't matter. But I I, I do see why you why you're confused. Um, okay, I want to do one application and then we're doing a break. Maybe there are more questions. talk about this uh, first application of this. circuits now what are some other measures there are a subset of the formal complexity measures that we've seen for uh, formulas and um, they were introduced by, by Ospolov who defined as follows so it's any 
it's any measure again or Boolean functions, okay? But now it has the following properties. I say mu of f and g plus mu of f or g is at most mu of f plus mu of g for any f and g, any Boolean functions f and g. So it applies only to the gate set f formula and f the norm, or to the gate set f the norm. I mean, we'll see what kind of gate set this applies to. Okay. Yeah, for now, this, yeah. I'm just defining some modular measures as any function mu from Boolean functions to the reals, for which you have this property, which is stronger than the property we've seen for formal complexity measures, right? Because I'm now upper bounding mu of f and g and mu of uh, f or g, both by the sum of mu of f and mu of g. Okay? So it's a subset of all the uh, formal complexity measures. And also I will normalize it on literals. Okay? Now, um, um, yeah, this is a subset of these uh, of these formal complexity measures, and there are examples of, uh, of very natural, um, like the rank measure, for example, is a sub-modular measure, which is uh, a tool that was both um, um, studied and um, what he proved here. is that as a low bound tool, these submodular measures, they won't do very well because if you apply well, we use that's very good. Uh, if you um, yeah, it's good to get uh, the exact words, useless. <laughs> um, if you compute m uh, mu of f, where f is any Boolean function on n inputs, and as both shows that if mu is a submodular measure, then this will always be uh, at most. You should call it vars of f for the size of the variable because n was in the usage for the, or I don't know what it is. Okay, yeah. the number of variables. Yeah. This is the number of variables of f. And so this both shows that. Uh, that mu of f will not, will not become uh, super linear ever for any Boolean function. So if that's your goal, which it should be your goal, then uh, you, should look, you should not look at some other measures. You should look at other uh, problems. Yeah, maybe it's a good uh, for people who don't see too much of complexity. Most functions require exponential size problems. They want to prove exponential low bounds, but this will not produce even to polynomial low bounds. Yeah. I don't know, Ram Ras proved this. Yeah, <laughs> that's always the thing. That's <laughs> good. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> um, okay, cool. So, um, as a remark, so uh, potentially also um, reproves this result. Um, uh, he reproved this in 2017 in a constructive way. We'll see this a little bit later if there's time. Um, for now, what I want to say is what are these comparator circuits? talk about the application. So what are these comparator circuits? It's another model of computation, but this is a really nice model because it only has a single uh, gate, namely the comparator gate, which takes two functions, f and g, and it produces f and g and f or g. Yeah, to outputs, to inputs. So, and this you, you, you compose, right? So you start with, uh, with your variables and then, and then we apply this gate. So it's like a simultaneous end or gate. So here I compute x1 and x2. Here I compute x1 or x2. And this I, this I start, uh, I make a big circuit here. So, right? so here I can by this gate again. Okay. And this way I have my comparator circuit. Yeah. So it's composed of this, just a single type of gate. It's called comparator because if you think of real values instead of bulla, what you get is a minimum and a maximum. So you just sort of sort them in the order of this pair of things. In, in, in Boolean, it's, it's yeah, Boolean are real. I'm just saying that for any real value, 
uh, and the null will be replaced by uh, mega Yeah, that's right. And what we count here is uh, the number of wires. So I again, so there's, there's one more gate that produces uh, like the literal that you start with at cost one. I compare the gate as cost zero. Nobody sees the blue, it's up to the blue. Okay. Yellow. Green. <laughs> yellow, yeah. Cost zero. Um, so what's the application? What, what do we, so um, since there's only this single gate, the compared to gate, of course, these submodular measures are precisely the, the, like the G complexity measures for that model, right? Um, I think that's also how the model came about. But um, um, yeah, so um, we can apply our duality theorem to the situation um, to get By duality, by our duality, we get as an application of our duality and, and this theorem of Kasparov, we get that amortized um, comparator circuit um, size of any Boolean function is at most uh, the number, is at most linear in the number of variables of the function. Okay. Um, and this is not so obvious if you just know, if you know this, just this result. So you, you need to use to do edit for that. All right. So I want so, to take a Yeah, yeah I just want to point out about this. Maybe it was not obvious, but this is uh, for, I hope I'm right. Uh, it's for one of uh, uh, functions or for all functions? All functions. All functions. Yeah. Yeah, any functions. So you can take uh, literal uh, with complement. Yeah. So, yeah. so it, it is. At least it can compute anything that the formula can compute. So that uh, may not be obvious. So for a single function, it can be exponential, but if you take many, many functions, you want all the same function computed many times, then you only need a linear. So, uh, yeah, the, the only cost, the amortized cost is linear in the number of variables. But you may need a double exponential in many functions to see this uh, cost savings. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Any more questions? Take a break? Yeah, good. Five minute break. Yeah, yeah no, that's <laughs> we would always do. We had teachers that would have like they would put their hands in their pockets all the time, and then they would have like old chalk here, and we would call them chalk thieves. <laughs> you know the top of that uh, song, plagiarize. Uh, yeah, I don't. Think, I don't. Well, I'll send it to you. Okay. It's one of the best songs about mathematics. Oh, really? <laughs> And it tells you to plagiarize and you should learn from the great Lobachevsky. <laughs> so, but yeah, the, What the is Lobachevsky? the size of this set? What? What is the size of a set of songs about mathematics? Maybe it's not difficult to read. Well, it's time. a good question. <laughs> you can write your own. Uh, but uh, uh, there is a line there about the, uh, the greatest that ever got choked on this court. Uh, this uh -huh. uh, this famous mathematician is the, the greatest that ever got choked on this court. <laughs> what I never understood is why he picked Lobachevsky because. Uh, uh, they just, yeah, you know, it's all uh, the, the three people discovered non Euclidean geometry right, yeah. independently at the same time. Right? So Gauss apparently knew about it long before Lobachevsky. <laughs> and then, uh, and then yeah. it was uh, Lobachevsky and there was uh, well, yeah, yeah, yeah. Bodiai well, yeah, in Hungary. <laughs> yeah, it was a, a, he was the son of a famous one, no, 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 no. whose dad worked on it all his life and he told his son not to touch it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I remember reading the letter, it was really funny. Yeah, yeah, it's really funny. So it's, uh, yeah, but anyway, so the question is uh, whether Lobachevsky had what uh, Bolyai was doing or not. Yeah. 
Oh, okay. I, I didn't know that people suspect him, but I, 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 I don't think people suspect him. I, 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 definitely, Tom Lennon didn't make it up. He, he picked up on some other. I see. I see. You know that he was a, a PhD master. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. 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 his song is hilarious. Yeah. Uh, he does it in heavy Russian accent. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's in English, but with an accent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's why I knew I could make it in math. I mean. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> You like it? I knew that was a good song. 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 He went to uh, UC Santa Cruz and he was uh, had a position for many, many years with got half in math and half in music. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, it's amazing. And, uh, and uh, yeah, but he has also talks about mathematics and talks about uh, yeah. What was his name? I, I'll send it to Sears, the end. It's okay. worth it. Everybody <laughs> knows it because it's like, oh, it's, it's like really from long ago. Yes. My, all my kids knew all his songs uh, by the age of 10. <laughs> yeah, we, that's the only cassette we had in the car. That's what we would sing in the, <laughs> on the long road. It's, it's hilarious. I mean, it's toys and pigeons in the park and lots of uh, radical. Uh, you know what were you saying about uh, Puritan's alternate proof? I actually forgot how you ended that sentence. It will come up, so it's... Uh... Oh, you may, yeah, first time. So Puritan proved also that upper bound in 2017, but in a constructive way. So he actually broke down, he constructed the uh, algebraic branching program, actually. Um, that, um, that's very efficient, amortized. And this, this implies also that this, this, uh, these, me these submodular measures are upper bounded linearly. Um, but it's much, yeah, but this is not, okay. It's very, it's very strong what it proves because it's not just a branching program as I described it. It's actually a very strong type of branching program um, which has to do with catalytic space. So I hope I'll get there. Cool. Nice um, Yeah. I already, uh, yeah, we are already go. All right. All right. Um, so we've seen lots of models, well, at least three models, like formulas, comparative circuits, branching programs. And for each of these models, we have uh, like the, the notion of a measure, right? A monotone measure. Um, and uh, like the first result was that in each of these cases, if you maximize over uh, all the measures, then you will get precisely the amortized uh, complexity relative to your choice of gate set. And I want to talk now about the second result, which is closely related. And um, yeah, it kind of introduces a, a newish phenomenon called um, yeah, catalytic circuit complexity. So, what is this? So, let me 
um, try to kind of introduce this as follows. If you have, if you're working with these measures and um, somehow you manage to, to prove an inequality for these measures, f and g are Boolean functions, and you manage to prove that the mu of n is at most mu of t, then this statement, because we're just dealing with, with, with real measures here, just these views are real measures, and this is just the usual inequality of real numbers, it's the same as saying um, mu of f plus mu of h for some other Boolean function h is at most mu of t plus mu of h. So what I want to say is here, because we're working with these real functions, if you're, if you're studying these kind of inequalities, you could add on both sides mu of h, and you would still have a valid inequality. Now, OK, sure. What does this mean for, uh, for circuits? Um, but let me try to explain this um, for comparator circuits. So I define for you a catalytic Character circuit. As follows, um, it's a let me draw it. So it's a comparator circuit. So remember, comparator circuit has um, it would start with uh, variables, right? Literals. X one, X two, X three bar, and then it has compared to gates, which is a single type of gate. It has the simultaneous and an or that it applies. Um, and this is what I'm doing in this, uh, in this rectangle. And then as an output, you get a bunch of functions. F1, F2, F3, say. This is a normal comparator circuit. Now, a catalytic comparator circuit, besides having literals as, it, as inputs, it will also have some other uh, Boolean functions, h1, h2, h3, say, as inputs. Like, uh, pick any, any Boolean functions you like. So they, they could be very expensive, maybe. You do your computation, but now in the end, I want you to reproduce all these Boolean functions that you have borrowed in your computation. So you get h1, h2, h3 for free in the beginning. You can do whatever you want in your computation, but in the end, you need to compute whatever you want to compute, so f1, f2, f3. But you also need to recompute your h1, h2, h3. And so these functions we will call catalysts, because like in chemistry, I mean, it's, a, it's a resource that you, that you have that, that makes the circuit possible, but it's not consumed in the end because you reproduce it. Yeah. Um, good, so this is for comparator circuits, but now you can imagine this, this definition for other types of circuits. Right? Maybe branching programs, you could do a similar thing. So um, what we prove here, I'm going to be a little bit brief about this, our theorem here. So in the branching program case, you get the back right? In the branching program case, so the way I started before is that you um, just start at a node uh, having no computation to start with. So you, have, you, do, you just have a constant one. But now I allow you to start in a way that you have already H1 computed. But then you start branching, doing your branching in your ORs, and then in the end you need to recompute H1 besides your goal, your target. Um, yeah, so you can now define, let me do this in one go, theorem definition. So um, we can define the catalytic uh, G circuit size of any Boolean function f as the size of the smallest catalytic circuit, let's say um, a comparator circuit that computes f, and you're allowed to choose yourself uh, what catalyst you want to use. And any number. Any number, yeah. So that's the definition of this, uh, right? this, this we can imagine for, for, for general uh, 
set of gates G. That's the definition of this uh, catalytic uh, complexity. Now it's clear, or is it this can this is, this is not more than the usual complexity. Um, what's a little bit harder to prove, but also not very hard, is that. So is this uh, C C tilde? No, no. This upper bound is the usual. No, no, the middle. In the middle. The middle is the catalytic. Yes, but you do it for one function. I do it for one function. You do it for one function. Yeah. yeah. And uh, and I want to compare this to the to the amortized complexity, which sits all the way at the bottom. So a catalytic um, circuit can be turned into a oops, can be turned into an amortized circuit. Um, that's not very hard to prove. I can I'll actually I can actually show you how to do that. Um, what we show here is that um, this we can write as some LP. It's amortized. Uh, certain complexity, and this will be the optimal inter integral solution to, to the same to the same LP. Okay. So um, yeah, so, so so using these kind of ideas, we, we cannot really we don't yeah we don't really know how to characterize this uh, circuit size, but we can characterize this catalytic circuit size. When you don't characterize it, it's an inequality. Sorry? Yes. Yeah. It's an inequality. Well, oh, you can this one, it as an integral. Yeah, integral. this is the optimal integral solution to the set to the LP that, that, that corresponds to the amortized circuit. Right, so it's, uh, it's uh, true for any set G. This is true for any set G. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And the, the H's, are those sort of, is that information included in your set G? You um, you no. Some fixed collection of them? You can choose to. You can choose them to be any Boolean functions you want. Oh. That's right. So they don't. They're not um, part of the gate set. For example, they're not. Uh, the gate set doesn't tell you which ones you're allowed to choose. You can. And, and for to another question along those lines, um, it, as n goes to infinity, the number of variables that H set has to be the. There's no uniformity condition. They can be totally different for every. Yeah, yeah, okay. that's right. Yeah, for any for any f, you can choose another set of. No, I don't just mean f. I mean maybe that's what you consider f. But like, you know, if you have a uniform function, uh, you know, for e, for every n, the the length, the. It's a non-uniform model. Yeah, it's not. Yeah, it, this yeah. Is, so this the is h's are like totally. So we get to we get to pick whatever we want for the h's, however many. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And they're essentially free. Yeah, they're free, but you have to give them back. <laughs> or it might be hard. Um, can you say a word as to why it would be hard if you get them for free? Can't well, you just sort of keep them? Well, okay, I, I, I can explain this. It's actually a very important point. We don't have, a, in these kind of models, we don't have a copy gate. So there's no way of, of just simply, like in, in this, uh, for example, in these uh, comparator circuits, there's, not, there's no gate that just copies a function. So I have this H1, and then I want to use it, but it's not like I can first copy it and then keep it over here uh, and then return it. I, if I use it, it will, it will be changed. So you will have to use it and then cleverly... And the first step would be like an all gate in the comparator circuit, you get the H or X, uh, the, uh, the another output H and X, but H itself is gone. Yeah, yeah. okay. So it's not so clear. Um, it's, it's not totally clear what the power of this is. <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, but, but we do know, of course, like, like relatively how powerful it is. Um, yes, okay. This is what I wanted to say here. This is the second result. And um, yeah, ah, let me maybe explain. Maybe this is nice to do here. Um, let me maybe explain why this inequality holds. So why does this catalytic kind of circuit give you an amortized circuit? Um, because this is actually quite easy. So just double checking. That's a minimization LP. This guy is a minimization LP. Yeah. 
that's right. Um, so the way you do it is uh, you just well, you have this in, in compactor circuits. You have this compactor circuit. You just scatter this, but now you just uh, put the same compactor circuit again. Um, Variable will need some x1, x2, x3 bar, and it needs these catalysts. But these catalysts I, I still have right, because I've reproduced them, so I can just feed them back in. Right? And I'll just run this compared to circuit, and this will again produce f1, f2, f3, and the catalyst. Okay, so I've, here I produced f1, f2, f3. Here I produce f1, f2, f3. So imagine f, f is the one I want to compute, right? So I've computed it uh, maybe twice here. Um, maybe just once. Um, here I compute it again. And this I can just repeat. Yeah, so you see that maybe h1, h2, h3 is very expensive. So naively, I would say, ah, oh, I just put a comparative circuit here in front that computes H1, H2, and 3 This could be a huge circuit. So but we, let's do this. Um, it doesn't matter that this is an expensive circuit, because we're going to repeat this many times, and we can just keep re re reusing these catalysts. So it's a one-off cost, uh, which amortizes this. It's not, it's not meaningful. Okay. Um, so that's roughly the proof of this. Uh, this inequality. It's like uh, you start with a catalytic algorithm, you boost it to an amortized algorithm. All right. Let's now talk about the third result, uh, which is about catalytic space. So I hope I have enough time to explain that. Um, so of course, catalytic space sounds very similar, just because that's the word catalytic. In it. One question. So yeah. the C tilde G of F, what would it be in the original Boolean formulas case as compared to C of F? Yeah, it will just be formula size itself. So it'll just be equal to C of F. Yeah, because formulas, if you want to compute a, a function multiple times with a formula, you cannot do anything else than just having many formulas next to each other, right. like a forest of formulas. So that's good. So that's consistent with how in that particular case your theorem had C of F is equal yeah. to the max over the mu's because it's the LP is integral, I guess, in that case. Um, yeah, I mean, it is just all collapses, and uh, yeah, yeah, you're right. Yeah, just because formulas don't have fed out, so there's never any way of producing like you can never um, have like an interesting amortized formula. Um, catalytic space sounds very similar. It's actually very different from catalytic circuit complexity, but still, I'm going to compare them, and still, we can actually use. Um, I, I, like um, things we proved in this setting to, to, to prove something new in this uh, catalytic space set. Now, yeah, catalytic space. I don't have too much time, so let me let me explain this briefly. Catalytic space is a is a computational model um, that was introduced in 2014 by by Biermann, Kief, uh, Kuchki, Lov, and Spielmann, and um, it's a Turing machine. In principle, it's a Turing machine model, right? So you're given a Turing machine. Um, and this Turing machine has, a, as usual, has an input tape and a work tape. But now it also has an extra tape, which is called the catalytic tape, um, which you can use in your computation. But the, the caveat is that this catalytic tape already has, a con has some content on it written. And um, you are allowed to do your computation using this catalytic tape, but you need to, in the end of the computation, um, return the state of the, the content of that tape back to its original state. And the computation has to work regardless of the content of that. Yes, that's exactly the point I want to, to, to make here. So, uh, so in catalytic circuits, our, our model over there, um, we, we say that there exists, the way the model works is we say that there exists a catalyst. Catalyst um, HI or a set of catalysts HI um, that can be used by the circuit um, and must be reproduced, right? So there exists uh, HI. And the circuit can depend 
on HI. Yeah, but HI is not like the value that is known. They are the function. Yeah, yeah, I know. So it does not really go I'm working, it's very, it's, it's high level, this comparison I'm making. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, that means this, uh, this intuition for catalytic space, we call the formal definition is correct. You have a program to run. Uh, but I'm going to work with non uniform. I'm yeah, yeah, no, yeah. 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 I'll do this in a bit. Yeah, but okay. You can okay, no, yeah. you can, uh, no, so maybe I first finish this, uh, this, 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 just this quick comparison. So I just wanted to say, I've already said it, but I just wanted to write like in catalytic space, um, uh, in the model, you want your, your Turing machine to work like for all. Uh, Catalytic tape content contents. So you're given the tape in, in, in some arbitrary content. Beforehand, you don't know what it's going to be, but um, your Turing machine always has to has to succeed. And the Turing machine, so the Turing machine cannot depend. This catalytic Turing machine cannot depend on on the tape content. So, so I yeah. think of it as uh, like you, are, uh, you have to run a program and you don't have enough space for your program, you want to compute something. But you are going to teach or steal the big disk of all the users in your university and use it for extra memory. Yeah. You, you use it for an extra space to do your computation. Only that you don't know what's there and you have to return it as it was. But yeah, like all the family photos. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. We want to return. Yeah. Sounds useless. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Those are useless. Yeah. Um, so, um, so these are very different. These are very different models, right? Uh, that's, that's what I wanted to point out here. And um, um, yeah, we don't really know how to relate these in a very precise. Uh, catalytic tape content. It means the those H one, H two, H three, the two order. Yeah. Well, like my. That's, that's the analogy, right? So these H's are my catalysts over there. That in, in, the, in, the, in the analogy, uh, that would correspond to the, to the tape content. But this is not a, um, like we, we, we thought, ah, maybe we can make this, maybe we can think of catalytic space as a catalytic circuit. But it's a different kind of model, precisely because it's like their existence for all uh, different. Uh, at least that's one, uh, that's one difference. But um, even though this, is, this looks very different, we can still translate some results uh, that we proved using our duality uh, to catalytic space. So I want to talk a little bit about that in the last 15 minutes. I actually don't quite understand what you mean by Turing machine cannot depend on the tape content. Well, so the Turing machine is a, is a Turing machine and it has an input tape that gets the input written on it. Yeah. And it gets uh, the catalytic tape, which, uh, which gets an arbitrary content. Okay, then is it not allowed to read the tape? Think of it as just a function. So the Turing machine is a function, right? Uh -huh. It's given x, I mean the function it wants to compute is f. So given x, it wants to compute f of x. And uh -huh. now uh, it's, it's uh, you know, running some program g, some function g. So the, uh, g has two inputs, zero, x and y. Okay. So you want uh, the output of g on x and y to equal f of x, y, for every one and every x. Yeah. You can write it. Uh, you want to write it. Yeah, okay, thank you. Okay, I uh, didn't catch the formula. <laughs> well, yeah, okay. Um, I, I want to move on to, to the non uniform version of this, and then I want to say something about our result. Um, so, uh, here we're talking about Turing machines, right? So, that's the uniform. Uh, Situation. Um, uh, Girard, Kuchki, and McKenzie in 2015 came up with like the, the, the non-uniform or circuit version of uh, catalytic space. So let me let me define this. So this is the non-uniform. This is non-uniform catalytic space. Uh, would you say catalytic space? What space? What is this space? The space is this memory, tape. Memory, yeah. memory. It's this memory. Ah, space, okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, so non-uniform catalytic space is defined using uh, something called an M. 
and that's the way I'm going to talk about it. It, it uses an M catalytic branching program. Now, branching program we've seen, we've also seen, we've seen, I've briefly mentioned catalytic branching program, we've seen amortized branching program. This is stronger, so this is an M catalytic branching program. Uh, it's going to be stronger than an amortized branching program. And I'll just, um, I'm just going to draw it, I'm just going to explain it by a, by a picture. So remember in a branching program, we have a bunch of start nodes, S1, S2, S3, Okay. And then we start applying our branching gates and our OR gates. And um, we then, so this is my branching program, we reach a bunch of output nodes. Now, in an M catalytic branching program, first of all, M is going to be the number of start nodes, three in this case. Then I also want the output nodes to be paired. So they come in an accept. A1 and reject R1 pair. So I will get three pairs Oops. A2, R2, A3, uh, R3. So these are just target nodes in my branching program, but they are paired up. And I want now my branching program to have the following property namely, for every setting of the variables, uh, x1 up to xn, I want um, a path from S1 to go to either A1 or R1. So you cannot, you're not allowed to go to the other, uh, except for check notes. Uh, same for S2, of course, so you could, well, you could have something complicated, but in the end, S to go to one of the, either A2 or R2. Same for S3. So this is one path out of the many bigger paths. That's right. So this is for one setting of my, my variables. I set this to some uh, Boolean values. I will get, I will see these paths from the start nodes to the accept reject nodes. And you have this pairing property between the start nodes and the accept reject nodes. This is very strong. Because it means that we're in, so suppose, um, okay. M catalytic branching program for for Boolean function f. What I want is that uh, I want to compute f here, and then automatically I will compute f. For check nodes, I will compute the negation of f. Right? Um, that's that's what the, that's the definition of an M catalytic branching program. What about the s? Sir. What is s one, s two, s three? These are these are these is just uh, names. Names, names of yeah. I just call these these nodes as one as two as two start nodes. Okay, and you allow paths to go to the wrong places. You just want there exist a path. There exists a flow, a perfect flow from the uh, M nodes to the. Approach. No, we don't. We don't allow. So there is no path. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, but the program has many legal paths uh, yeah. for a given input. Yeah. You don't allow any path to go from SI to uh, output J. That's right. Okay. Yeah. Um, well, okay, this is, looks just like a very strong notion of a branching program. So how is this, how is this at all related to catalytic space? So I won't say too much about it, but you can turn such a branching program into, into a Turing machine um, um, in a way that the, like the content of the catalytic tape um, Will like like will be an index for where, which starting node you use, and you will use the catalytic tape to keep track of where you are uh, in this in this branching program. Um, and the point is that this kind of computation you can do in a reversible way, so you can like kind of undo it and get the catalytic tape back to its original content. So that's a I can't say too much more about it because I want to. But how is space measured here? Space will be um, I mean it corresponds to n. Right. So it's uh, uh, like the catalytic tape will have, um, I can encode, um, like this, is, this is the content of my catalytic tape, like alpha 1, alpha 2, etc. And this, this alpha I will interpret as, as an index to. Right, so in reality, what you're doing is only one computation. 
right? Uh, only one of these really takes place. That's what you you start from yes. whatever you don't know which copy or so, what is the content of the catalytic state. It just tells you which start how it is at this part of the computer. Yeah, right? yeah. That's how you will be using the the branching program. Yeah. Um, and good, but that's all background. Just to just to connect this a little bit. Um, what I want to talk about is. Um, that um, these people that define this, this notion, such as Kuchki and Mackenzie, they ask um, for which Boolean functions is, uh, does there exist an, an efficient and catalytic um, a branching program? So, okay, so sorry, I'm still uh, yeah. Yeah. the yeah. size of the branching program is what? Or the space complexity is what? Is the space model? complex, the, like, the size of the tape, sorry, yeah, okay, maybe this is the size of the catalytic tape corresponds to M. And what is the space, M? Um, well, the space. What is sorry. the space complexity of something? Yeah, what's the complexity? It will be the size of the branching program. The so size of the branching program. So you pay, but the size of the branching program is at least the number of possibilities in your tape. But it's amortized, right? So. Uh, oh, it's amortized. Good. Okay. Is, yeah, yeah. I'm also computing f m times. Okay. Yeah. Good, good. So you are computing f m times. Good. Yeah. Actually, yeah. It's really converging. Um, so there was an important question here. So asking, um, does the, do there exist Boolean functions for which the m catalytic branching program size is strictly smaller than the branching program size? Um, and um, protection, so this is what I referred to earlier, proved that the answer is yes. This is in uh, 2017, also ah, yes. He shows um, every Boolean function f has an n catalytic branching program uh, of size big O of n times n. And n is the number of variables. M is the same M. So I'm computing F M times at cost M times N. So amortized in an amortized sense, this is a linear, about linear in the number of variables. That's what, uh, so protection like, like gave, a, gave a construction to do this. Um, M, interestingly, M is really big, this kind of construction, namely, like W exponential in, in N. Um, but, but it also means that you're computing F like, a, like many times. Okay? So it's, uh, amortizes is still a good, good upper bound. Um, so what do we prove? Switch this. Third result is that for every Boolean function f, um, there is an m catalytic branching program um, for f uh, of size. O of n times n still, but we can do it with m uh, smaller, namely 2 to the power yeah, n choose at most d, so this is the sum of the first d by uh, the coefficients, where with d being the f2 degree of the Boolean function f. So the degree of Boolean function f written as a polynomial over f2. The minimum degree. 
Oh, that's your name. Yeah, yeah. That's for anyone. Yeah. <laughs> anyone who didn't know. Uh, yeah. Um, so yeah, so we, we can improve on this uh, on the number of copies that you need. So the primitive function would have just uh, two to the end. Uh, for example, yeah, yeah. Anything with a low degree, um, you can save. And um, um, the way we prove this is that we yeah we translate um, we translate a similar result that we prove for um, for like uh, yeah in the setting that the duality theorem holds and we kind of we then translate that to an actual construction uh, which is a little bit technical so I won't I'm not going to do that and um, second comment here that we actually use uh, uh, symmetry so we exploit all kinds of um, notions of symmetry of Boolean functions, which protection also does already, but somehow we do this, uh, yeah, we study this deeper and, uh, and get this better, better bound. Um, cool, so I've reached the end of my time, so maybe I'll just end with um, saying a couple of things. So, yeah, we proved this duality theorem for amortized circumplexity. It's, it's, it's a much more general theorem. Um, the, way it, it, the way it relates to Strassen duality is that Strassen duality works for semi rings, and our uh, theorem works for semi groups. So uh, uh, these are kind of different settings. Um, but still, our duality is very, is very general. And of course, you can, you can ask uh, what else can be done with it. So let me just end with that quickly. Um, Um, yeah, what other what other direct sum problems or amortization problems can be expressed using this kind of um, duality? So here we've been talking about circuit complexity, but of course, well, you can think of other things. I mean, for example. The result about uh, that, inform that information complexity equals randomized communication. Right. Does it fit in this kind of uh, framework? Where we don't we don't really know. You can think of all kinds of other uh, models of computation. So this doesn't really this list doesn't really end. Um, can the catalytic space bound be be improved? So this m can we can can one actually improve on this on this bound? We don't know. And um, yeah, well, there are lots of other questions I could ask, but this is uh, these are the main things. So. Thanks. Great. Uh, questions? Questions from the audience? Zoom audience or forever audience? Can you say a word about the LP that we? Oh yeah. Of course, I had this prepared, and then of course I didn't have time. Good question. Um, yeah. I would say something briefly about it. Um, like what the I'll show you what the, uh, yeah. It's not nice, actually. So, let's all remember. So we have this one side, and then the other side should correspond to the amortized, the amortized complexity. This side is very easily seen to be an LP. This side is a little bit harder. So I'll just start with the, with the left hand side. Um, for example, for comparator circuits, let me do it for comparator circuits. So we have, we're maximizing over, we're maximizing mu of f, right? Um, and we think of mu as a very long vector which assigns a real number to every Boolean function. So it's a, and that's a finite set because I fixed the number of variables to be one. So mu is a, long vector of real numbers. We want to maximize one of its coefficients. And um, uh, subject to uh, two rules, so, well, two rule schemes. So um, we want mu of g or h plus mu of g and h to be at most mu of g plus mu of h for every Boolean function mu. Uh, for every Boolean function g and h. 
which is just a linear relation, linear inequality on the coefficients of, of mu, mu thought of as a vector. Uh, right, so this is many, this is for every pair of G and H, I get this uh, condition. So that's, that's one set of inequalities. And then I have another set of inequalities for the literals, where I say mu, the, that mu has value at most one. Um, so this is clearly an LP. Yeah, that's a, it's a famous point of I did a channel consider it uh, because entropy is a somewhat I mean, it's a complete function. Anyway, it's the analog, the, the discrete analog is somewhat the uh, mm -hmm. There are, there are yeah. questions about uh, you know, which information theoretic inequalities uh, you know, right. uh -huh. are derived from yeah. these ones. That, uh, yeah. yeah, this, yeah, I wrote it down for submodeler. You could, but this works for any G circuit. Uh, you just need to you need for every kind of for every type of circuit for every type of gate sorry, you will get uh, one type of inequality. So that's how you get your your primal LP. Okay. Now, what's sorry, yeah? Just a so do we fix like the number of inputs? We yeah. fix yes. This is in like two to the two to the two. Yeah. Okay, that's yeah. the space. Yeah. Of this, right? Yeah. Okay. The, mu is a very long vector. Um, now. We take the LP dual, and what happens then um, is actually quite nice. So the easiest way to think about it is that but the way I set this up is um, like like for for every gate you get the uh, you get these these relations. So I want to think of um, ideally I want to define a pre order, but let me be brief. So for comparative circuits, we would have uh, this kind of relation. Say, so let me just let me just write this down. So if I have F and G, I can compute F and G and F or G. That's what my gate does. So maybe this I this is a relation um, or an inequality. And let me use the notation that um, um, in this case, if uh, if this relation is inequality, if it uses F, then I write F. Um, well, G, I'm not sure about this. I write, I don't even know how to call this thing. But I write, uh, so R, R consumes F. And um, R also consumes G. And R produces F and G. And R also produces um, F or G. So you have such an R for every pair of functions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, for any kind of relation that I that, that my gates give me, yeah. I have a, I have an R, and I, I just wanted to define this this notation. That's why I'm writing this down. Then, what's the LP tool? It's a minimization of the following thing. It's like over the it's, we have a sum over all the at least generating relations. Um, the cost of, uh, of R um, times Y of R. So Y is another is another vector which assigns a real number to every relation, the primal LP. And um, subject to three rules. For the first says you need to um, like if you um, if you look at the, the relations that produce G and you look at the relations that consume G then you want your consumption to be to be at most your production so this is a kind of a sanity rule um, and so yeah, this, so this is saying you, you, you're applying these kind of uh, gates, but you can only apply it in a way that you can uh, you can apply to Boolean functions that you actually have. And then you can apply the you can apply the gate. That's what this is saying. And the second one is saying that if you look at only the rules that produce f, which is our goal uh, function, right? Then I want the sum of the values they get to be at least uh, the 
the sum of the values that we give to relations that consume f plus one. Because I want to be left with at least one copy of f. This one comes from this other part. And um, I know from this, from because we have yeah, this, because we have this objective value. And the final thing is that y has to be unnamed. Now, yeah, so I'm not going to explain this fully, but uh, this dual LP, this, this vector y, you can turn into an amortized circuit. So it tells you how many times you use every gate R. Um, so then you have a whole list of gates with like the frequencies, and then uh, you need what to figure out. If it's integral, you can turn it into a circuit. <laughs> So if it's not integral, so let's say okay, you, want, you, you make this a rational LP, so then you, so y would be rational, then you make it integral by just multiplying a big enough integer. That will get, so now we're going to get an amortized uh, circuit. Um, but there's one step in between, namely there can be catalysts. Um, and then you do this trick that I did before, like you can boost away these catalysts and make it amortized. Okay, so there are a couple of steps. So the pre-processing with the computing all the catalysts yeah. in advance. Yeah. And then doing the catalytic circuit many times. So there are a couple of things to do after this. But, uh, so to you said that the, the, the integral solution corresponds to something and the rational yeah. so the, the, the fractional solution. So this linear program is a fractional solution. And it's uh, there is duality there, like the linear programming duality, I assume, because you just wrote the dual. And uh, the integral solution captures what? The integral dual solution yeah. captures catalytic complexity. Catalytic, yeah, so uh, catalytic complexity. Good, yeah. okay, yeah. yeah. Actually, if you have an integer solution, it actually has to come from the integral solution. Like you, you know how many times you have to use each R, but you can always arrange them yeah. in such a way that it like, because, computes what you want. Because, I mean, why is that? I mean, this looks weird, right? I mean, you give it all these gates, and then we only have frequencies, and we have some kind of sanity like relations that overall you will only consume what you've produced. But it doesn't immediately tell you that you can actually puzzle them together so that it's a valid circuit. Like, that's not, that's not immediately contained in these. Uh, um, so also Robin and I have been, well, I've done many computations, like actual, we've written down as LP and like put it on the computer and did many numerical experiments. And um, it's also easy to get nice circuits out of this. But so the, why does this always give a circuit? It's because um, it's, it's, it's really silly what you do is, um, like say you have this, uh, this, this gate. So it uses x1 and g, some other function, which you have to produce at some point, and you don't know when you're going to do it. Um, so yeah, you just put it here. Then you have another gate. So this is your free, this is the vector y. It tells me which gates I have. Uh, another gate. Um, so this produces, I don't know, produces f and h. Um, well, this guy, it maybe uses x2 and h. But yeah, so well, it, it turns out I have H over here. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to use this as a catalyst. That's really the brute force way of making this work. And um, so for example, uh, maybe this gate produces G and F. Um, so so the, what the point I'm trying to make is you, the vector Y, it, gives you how, it tells you how often, uh, how many of each gate you have. You just put them all below each other. And then the relations will tell you um, that like um, uh, besides the literals, there will only be catalysts. So that's how you that's how it becomes a catalytic circuit. Maybe I should, yeah. For people uh, who've seen uh, uh, for, for the first time that you can take an out another set of gates and they have to arrange themselves in a <laughs> they have to arrange themselves into a circuit. Uh, here uh, but it also here it's not obvious, but you have the catalyst which help you. But it's a uh, much more a general and important general circuit that comes from the approximation method of Ross Ball, where he showed that uh, you know basically circuit lowdowns, uh, even though there is order of circuits, can be described as covering problems as integral and piece, uh, uh, and uh, he proves that this method is complete in the sense that uh, 
if you ever know about the discovery, which is just basically a bunch of gates, you can arrange them into a circuit that's not much more costly than the cost of the program. If you want to read about this, I have a survey called of the fusion method in my in my uh, yeah, uh, website. Or a book, or a, uh, anyway, yeah, so it's, it's, it's amazing. The first time it was understood, it's uh, sort of uh, shocking. He uses it to prove highly non trivial lower bounds on the uh, on, uh, branch program side, non deterministic branch program side for majority non linear lower bounds. Uh, yeah, it's, it's uh, sort of really amazing. Yeah. Yeah, I don't think we know whether that's uh, like a one of these measures, mu. Yeah, yeah. We try to. Any questions? All questions. All right, Thanks.